Okay, I think I'm live. Looks like I'm live. It says I'm live. So hello everyone. Hello everyone. I'm just gonna bring up all the streams here so I've got them. Very exciting. Very exciting indeed. Uh, I'm just gonna bring up the, the, the thingo here. Sorry, the very technical talk at the moment, the thingo. Um, here we go. Make sure that volume's down on that. Uh, Steve Arias, Raymond Bear, Robert George Akers. I didn't really say, didn't mean to say your full name, but you know what I mean. Everyone's tuning in, which is great. Um, it's just a bit of feedback coming through, so much which I'm going to kill off now. That's great. Okay, live. I'm live. Yes, Danielle, good to see you. Hope everyone's well. Um, everything's going off really well tonight. Everything's hooking in nicely. Everything's working. Happy Friday to you all. Happy Friday. The Friday live uh, each week at the moment has been the Friday night drinks, the Friday Q and A and drinks. Uh, there's a Zoom link. <coughs> pardon me. There's a Zoom link up on, in the Facebook group at the moment. Uh, I'll post it again uh, in case anyone wants to jump in Zoom with me. That's you're more than welcome to. Um, honestly, it's fine. Um, I don't bite. Uh, I'm just going to copy that URL. So if anyone wants to jump in Zoom with me, I'll put the link again in the group. Just in case anyone wants to, of course, uh, your call. Good to see you all. Um, lots of people tuning in live, which is fantastic. Um, which and uh, happy Friday to you all. Uh, it's Friday night drinks here at the um, at the SMWS Ambassador HQ, whatever you want to call it, my office. Uh, and I've got a, a cleansing ale. Uh, I've got a grifter. Now I've not tried this before. It's a Marrickville beer. Um, it's a Pilsner, four point four percent. Uh, and I like those those that proof in a beer. I like a good anything between 3.5, 4.5. I love in that in a beer. I know that's unusual for someone who likes cast strength whiskey, but I've said it before. I like my whiskey uh, cast strength, and I like my beers mid proof. That's just how I like them. That's fine. Uh, other than that, uh, just chilling out here. Bit of music playing, as you can. I hope you can hear that. I wonder if you can. If it's too loud. Tell me, I'll turn it down. Um, I've got a uh, like I say, a bit of grifter. It's a it's a Merrickville beer. I hope that's flipping around for you okay there. Um, Merrickville, New South Wales, of course. <laughs> Merrickville, Sydney, whatever. Uh, and I've got a cleansing ale going on here. Happy Fridays to you all. Uh, now, I've also got a whiskey on my desk here. Ooh, just out of frame. And it is one of the festival bottlings, and I thought I might preview it tonight. If you want to have a chat about it, if you want to ask questions about it, this is, of course, the 35254. How could I not start with the 35? Only because it's 35, so one of my favorite distilleries. Uh, I'm going to, here we go. Jump in here with Steve. Steve's coming in here. Good to see you all. Oh, Steve, mate, how are you? Well, looks like his audio is just connecting at the moment. Uh, oh, now he's got around the right way. Uh, it, your audio did not connect, Steve, it said. Um, oh, no, maybe it did. There we go. Um, Steve, can you hear me? Uh, I can see Steve, but I can't hear him. Doesn't look like your audio is connected yet, Steve. That's right. Well, he'll be right back. <laughs> what do we need to talk about, Alex? Does, is it is it not too, is it is it a bit offensive? Is, are you okay with it, <laughs> Steve? Are you there? Hello, yes. Hey, how you been? Good, thank you. How's it going? This is not a Sunday sipper, but it is a Friday night drink. I hope you're well, mate. Well, uh, hold on a second. Oh, what's that? Was that a sailor's grave? You're a sailor's no, grave. No, it's 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 quite deeds. Uh, juice train. Yeah, very cool. Yes. <laughs> Well, that's working. I'm just checking that the video is working, and it is. Alex Dahlenberg says, when you talk about this background music, I don't know what's wrong with this background music. The background music is amazing. <laughs> uh, I'm missing out on the background music. Where's that? Uh, hold on. You should better catch it. Or maybe it's just... Oh, it's there. It's definitely there. I turned it down a bit so I could hear you, because I couldn't hear you before. Um, oh, cheers anyway, Matt. Cheers, mate. Good to see you. Good to see you. I uh, hope you're well. Very. Very well. Um feel like uh, Caleb says, I feel like I'm waiting in some elevator. 
look at okay. There's Ellen Degeneres. Herbert Morton. 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 Herbert Mate, how's your um, how's your how's your week been? How's how's, it, how's everything been for you, mate? Uh, it's been good. Uh, yeah. Very hectic, obviously, with my um, with where I work, as opposed to a lot of other people who aren't in a, a as fortunate situation. It's good to be busy, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Look, that's just I, I'm st- I still reckon you're intercepting half my parcels at the moment. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. Look, obviously, there's a a bit of a backlog. You see a bottle shaped just... parcel that's addressed to Matt Bailey, and you're like, I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> Ain't gonna happen. For those who don't, who for those who are out of the loop on that one, Steve works for Australia Post. Uh, what, what remind me what you do at Australia Post? Like, you're, you're... Uh, I, I facilitate parcel delivery, so maybe I should leave right about now. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So if, if um, yeah, if if um, if your parcel's not arrived, then uh, you can blame Steve. That's fine. Blame him. Directly. <laughs> no, no, don't give him any hell. Australia Post are doing a lot at the moment, and I, I've got to, uh, I've got to commend them honestly. Like to go from needing whatever the benchmark was to suddenly everyone sending everything all the time, uh, and you know, like it's obviously parcel delivery is. Uh, am I wrong there? Is it as parcel delivery exploded in in size and? Yeah. Look. It- Generally speaking, it's been the, the savior for the business. Um, but in the last month or so, it's just exceeded all expectations and all um, plausible ways of getting things delivered. This is this point in time is bigger than any Christmas we've ever experienced. Um, just double what we would normally have to deal with at Christmas time. So it's seven days a week at the moment. And if you're getting deliveries on Saturdays and Sundays, my God, you're lucky. <laughs> I've had a couple of Saturdays. A couple of Saturdays. Yeah. Cross. Yeah. yeah. Uh, two. Well, I've had two. Yeah. There'll be some tomorrow, but only after one o'clock. Yep. And there'll be some on Sunday, I would imagine. Yeah, right. Ah, oh, Jeremy Dornay is here. Let's, ha- let's, let's bring Jeremy in. He's been sitting in the waiting room. Ah, uh, Jeremy. Sorry, mate. Let me bring you in there. Mr. Dornay, the, the tallest, handsomest man in the world. Where is he? Let's see if this works. Uh, his audio is connecting. Here we go. More the merrier. It's Friday night drinks, guys. We are going live, of course, just so you all know. We are going live to the Scotch Pot Whiskey Society group. So, you know, keep keep it fairly PG-ish. I mean, we're all I over. can hear the music now. It's very low. <laughs> very low, very low. I was talking too much before. Uh, Jeremy's Jeremy's connecting. Jeremy's connecting. Looks like he's, uh, he's working at it. He's getting there. Uh, anyway, before it gets too chaotic on here, Matt, I've um, I've opened a sample that I received from Mr. Walkzak earlier in the week of a uh, SMWS seven dot one two eight. Sneaky which, bastard, Mr. Yeah, which Walkzak. Is- he didn't return my call earlier today, so <laughs> if, you're, if you're watching, no, I remember, I remember that cask. I think I actually remember he. I was with him when we opened that one. What's the specs on it? Uh, it's a nineteen eighty five distilled. <sighs> A 30-year-old coming in at 54% ABV. Man, 54% after 30 years still is impressive. Yeah. And uh, it's um, it's got some nice oak on it. Like it's fairly... Fairly sherried, I'd imagine. I don't, I don't know what, what the cask was. That's not actually mentioned on this sample. But yeah, I'd say it's a sherried... If anyone maybe wants to pipe up with maybe it, it's team refill. It. Yeah, it could be it could be team refill. I doubt it's a first fill anything after thirty no. years. No. Um seven dot one two eight, did you say? Yeah, seven dot one two eight, yeah. It really wasn't it that smells bad. amazing, man. I've had it in the glass about fifteen minutes before this started. Yeah. And uh yeah, it's it's beautiful. <laughs> uh Sonata of Sapidity, thirty year old refill ex bourbon hogshead. Wow, ex bourbon. Okay, yeah, there you go. And I actually remember that cast because it was um, I think I was with I was with Walzak when he opened it, and it was a part of a special bottling. Uh, it was he opened I think five or six thirty year old whiskeys for his thirtieth. Ah, uh, yeah, okay. 
And I think that was one of them. And it was just like the total outturn of that bottling was 72 bottles. Uh, Wow. And that's one of them there. So that's very cool, man. 72 bottles. Jeez. That's ridiculous. Glad glad to be tasting that. Thank you, Walt Zach. Thank you, Walt Zach. Uh, Good on you, Jono. You know what? Fine. Where's my sample, Jono? That's on my call every so often. You know what? It's on camera. I've said it now. Yeah, it's documented. Well, well, well. Look who's showing up in the in the chat now. Here we go. He, let's bring him in. Let's bring him in here. Matt Waller. Uh, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> his audio is connecting. Looks like it's connecting. A, a regular a regular guest on on the Friday night drinks and Q and A with SMWS and occasional host and overall legend. Uh, where is he? We've got visual. His audio's out. Can't catch his audio. We'll let him work that out whilst his dogs walk around and and, and judge him for his, his bad audio. <laughs> now, I'll, I'll let you guys introduce each other, but it's, it's um, Matt Wooler works for us sometimes at the Society. He's a sometimes like an occasional uh, Sydney host when we're doing events, of course, uh, and also is a... Um, uh, Runs his own uh, uh, whiskey tasting company called Dram Nation that does uh, events mostly out west in Sydney. And he loves Hawaiian shirts hey. by the looks of it. Hey, hey. Here we go. hey, where's the big Glenn Fiddick hat? What's going on? You want one? <laughs> I can get one. <laughs> I'll stay here a moment. Uh, Matt, meet Steve. Steve, meet Matt. Hey, Hello, saying? Matt. How you doing, buddy? Good, good. Good Man, to meet Mosquitoes in this room. Anyway, I'm here. I need a dram. I've only got a beer at the moment. Uh, I was going to open this 35, so I will open this 35 because I was going to. So this is one of the festival bottlings uh, coming up next month. That's how it, sound check, sound check. You got to make sure it's got the right sound. Yeah, it's pretty good. Sounds like whiskey. Yeah, it sounds like whiskey. Just a smidge. Wow. Okay, the first thing I'll tell you about that, the oiliness on that. Just the, the way it's sort of like olive oil into the glass just then. That's a 10-year-old in the deep, rich and dried fruits. Um, and I'll, I've got the full specs here, which was interesting. So 10 years, it was uh, nine years in ex Oloroso, one year in heavy char punchin, a new oak punchin, so a virgin oak punchin finish. Mm. Um I'll be completely honest. I'm often skeptical of virgin oak uh, in Scotch whiskey. Uh, yeah. You don't think so? <laughs> I perhaps, love it. Pa- perhaps I love it. it almost makes it a <laughs> Yeah, just drink a bourbon instead. <laughs> <laughs> perhaps uh, if it's used sparingly, it's uh, can be can be quite good. Yeah, used sparingly. I agree. It's it's. I think it's a much like fin- using finishes in. Uh, like ex sherry, ex rum, ex port, whatever. I think it should be uh, treated with a sense of um, uh, caution, not not a feature. Yeah, sort of like, power. You can definitely yeah. overpower. Exactly, and I always think of a, a finish or an maturation should be a um, should be icing on the cake, not the cake. Um, so it should be that nice little sweet sweetness at the end, not the body of the whiskey. Uh, Joey says, um, Matt, when Matt says punchin', I hear it as punch him. Hmm. Okay. Well, I mean, if you want to get punched, Joey, I mean, I know, I'll know where to find you. Um, uh, Caleb says, don't let Seamus hear you, Matt. No, that's true. Uh, I know that Seamus is a big Virgin Oak fan. Um, uh, he's of course referring to Seamus Carroll from uh, our friends over at Brown Foreman. So whiskey sound is squeak pop. There you go. Hashtag open your bottles. And Robert Akers asks, uh, Wooler, where's the dogs, Matt? Oh, just got, there's one here. See that one? Yep. <laughs> Where's your brother? Where's your brother? They're here. Believe me, they're here. <laughs> here he comes. I can hear him. There he is. There he is. Dogs are here. Doggos. Doggos. It's doggo time. Oh. <laughs> is that enough um, dog for you? That's enough dog. <laughs> back, back to my shiny cranium. <laughs> well, that's your that? that's your lighting situation. I think it goes from um, I think we're we're like currently Wooler's 
shiny cranium. I'm moderately overgrown, and Steve over here is is, is, is uh, basically bigfoot Sasquatch uh, in levels of hair. So we're we've, got, we've we've got all bases covered. <laughs> And all faces, perhaps. I don't know. <laughs> Definitely got faces for radio. <laughs> yes. Good, good looking mugs for radio, these guys. <laughs> I'll include myself in that. It's okay. <laughs> what are the- you drink what are you drinking, Mr. Wooler? I have an open bottle of fifty five point five seven digging up ginger. Oh, yeah. Sounds good. Now this is this is fabulous. It's got a really, really interesting sort of viscous creaminess to it, uh, and a nice sort of uh, spice at the end. The nose is really sort of a lot of white sugar going on in there, and a little bit a uh, little bit of meringue, I guess you could say something like that. A little bit of lemon meringue. If I just remember that one being really like the the refill character of that the fr- that the the, dis- the distillate from that distillery from distillery fifty five. Uh, is quite fruity. It's quite a fruity distillate. So yeah, that combined with a lovely refill um, mm-hmm. makes for, makes for a nice whiskey. Yep. So uh, refill Hogshead ex bourbon. Um, for everyone on the um, on the um, Facebook group, of course, you are welcome to join in via Zoom or on the Facebook comments, which are coming in nice and thick and strong. Of course, um, do as you please, please. And um, if you and join, you can join. I think the link's in there. Preference if you've got dogs. <laughs> So I've, how's, the, I've, how's the 35, Matt? I've let that sit for just a couple of minutes. Um, it's a big proof on it. It's 63.9. So for wow. a 10, it's, it's a big whiskey for an 11 year old. I said 10, didn't I? Sorry, it's actually 11. 11, 11 year old. Sorry. Um, I'm only one year off. Um, uh, oh, man. That's another error I just saw in the outturn. There you go. <laughs> rushing it through. Rushing it through. Fire the designer. Fire him. It's, <laughs> <laughs> It's a forty-page outturn, mate. So there's going to be a couple of uh, a couple of errors here and there. Anyway, it's an eleven-year-old uh, single cask, as you know. Uh, nine years in uh, in Exoloroso, two years in Virgin Oak, and the Virgin Oak is evident on the t- like that that top sort of like you know that top bourbon kind of note, like whack uh, like waxy hazelnut kind of thing going on. Um, it's definitely it's definitely got that lovely space ID kind of like. Glenn Murray character I like. What's the price of it? What's the price? Tell, tell them the price, son. Um, it is, uh, I have to bring up out turn again, sorry. It's um, $1.99. Yep. So it's a festival release. It's Speyside Festival bottling coming out uh, on the 1st. So it's a week away from today. Um, What's it? What is it? One of eight? One of a nine? One of eight? Bottles? I don't know. It's 30. That's 30. No, 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 no. I mean out of the festival releases. Oh, one of 10. One of 10, yep. Yeah. There's ten festival releases, and the, of course the ballot bottlings are the twenty-two year old twenty-nine dot two six eight, and the twelve uh, year old thirty-three dot one three nine. And everyone goes a little bit silly over the thirty-threes, and I understand it, but um, I think there's some other gems in there, like the fifty-three and the, the ninety-three. I'm looking forward to trying, and because I like a nice older Campbelltown whiskey. Uh, Just to comment on the on the ballot system there, Matt, has that been? embraced or has there been a bit of backlash with it because i actually think it's a pretty good idea to um make sure that everyone gets a fair go at getting it like with internet problems withstanding i i I did have one member message me um a couple of days ago saying oh how how is the 33 going to be sold and i said by ballot and and the response was oh that that kind of sucks and i was like well look at it this way if you're a member if you're a member who lives in sydney with a really really good nbn connection or you're a member who lives in Margaret River with a dial-up connection, I want them both to have the same chance of getting a bottle. Yeah. So yeah. by doing ballot, look, we'll have, I think, 15 bottles for ballot of that 33. Uh, and I'm, I think we've already had uh, more than three times that in terms of ballot entries just today alone. But I just think that we're going to... What it means is we'll do a random selection. And we'll just put it through, through a, a random selector online. Just done. They're the names. And it's just like, it keeps it really fair and balanced for everyone who... Uh, who wanted one. And yes, of course, people are going to miss out. But that means that the 15 people will be randomly selected rather than who had the f- fastest click and log in on the day. Yeah, well, people are going to miss out whether it's that way or not. So Exactly. Yeah, it's, yeah, yeah. It's, probably, it's probably better to be totally up to chance than your internet connection, no. for argument's sake. 
Yeah, much fairer. Mm. Oh, no, I had a question. <laughs> yeah, that is definitely sixty three point nine percent. Wow, what a team! That is like a fruit thing on the palate, though. It's like all oaky and um, soft on the nose. It's like that waxy sort of waxy nuts and soft fruits on the nose, but it's like a nuts. It's like uh, throwing a whole packet of fruit tingles in your mouth for um, the palate. Wow. What was your question, Mr. Wooler? Ah, yes, my question. Um, and this is something that, that, that I thought about yesterday when Matt and I was chatting. And uh, it's, it's, I was chatting when we were chatting. Um, and that was to do with the uh, flavor profiles. Now, I don't know whether you, you're privy or not to this information, but is there hidden flavor profiles in the society, like maybe ones that either in the future the society might uh, release additional flavor profiles in the spectrum, or were there profiles that they sort of just abandoned because there was uh, too many to choose from? I don't know about the former. Um, I don't know if they're working on other flavor profiles to include in the range and what they would be that aren't already covered. I mean, that, oh, I got a call coming in. Uh, awesome. Let's take a live call. Let's take a live call. Ignore me. That's fine. No, I'll come back to you, Wooler. It's fine. It's fine. Hello, you're tuned in live on SMWS Australia. Welcome to the show. Hello. 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 Who's speaking? Hi. Can you, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Oh, good, good. Uh, society more Invergordon soon? Ah, Invergordon. What's the code for that? Can someone remind me what the code is for Invergordon? Hmm. Um, bear with me a moment. G something. No, uh, no. You mean like Inverleven or Invergordon? Gordon. Ah, like G5. Like the train. Yeah, yeah. Who's speaking? Sorry, who's more. calling? But 31 years, so only, only 31 years old. Which one? Must be 31 years. Is that you, Scotty? <laughs> <laughs> I think that was Scotty. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was our first call for the night. Well, at least he didn't ask for his, his Zodiac uh, reading and Tats Lotto numbers this time. Well, you know... It- <laughs> <laughs> well, win, win some, lose some. Um, wow. He'll, he'll be back. <laughs> I welcome it. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Wooler. No, I'm sure there's... I, I don't know about the former. I don't know if they're in, investigating other profiles because the 12 are sort of meant to be just a guiding light for each one. So like in the deep, rich and dried fruits is a good example. You'll have everything from like an 11-year-old virgin oak to a 30 year old sherry oak and all everything in between and sort of thing. It's like, so there's going to be a broad diversity within each profile already. Hmm. Um, but I'm sure there were that they did discard. Yeah. And I'm, I, I'm really quite fascinated by the fact that out of the 12, four of them uh, in, encapsulate peat. So different peating profiles. Hmm. So, so like oily and coastal, you find some peat. Things like 52s, 93s. Of course, flavor profile is not defined by code, as you know, but often it can be. Yep. Uh, but just as you can have, you know, unpeated expressions from peated distilleries that fall under other flavor profiles, like some spicy and sweet 93s, some spicy and sweet 53s. Uh, but I'm sure like, that's why I like the fact that there's oily and coastal, lightly peated, peated and heavily peated. Like I like the fact that there's a stretch across the flavor profiles rather than just sort of, oh, this is a peated whiskey. Mm. Yeah, but what kind of peat is it like, you know, yep. 80 parts per million or is it five? And it's, and also all those kind of things. But yeah, I like that though. <laughs> Joey says this is turning into a Simpsons gag about the, the prank caller. I, I think it is. I think you know what, Scotty? I know you're watching. So you know what? Thank Hot you. Hot dog, we have a wiener. <laughs> mm. That was definitely Scotty. I bet you it's Scotty. It was Scotty. I don't need to be convinced. It's fine. <laughs> <laughs> uh very cool. Uh, big big shout out to Irina, Emily Jane, Ivan Myers. Good to see you all. Um, we're all having a few sort of cloudy looking beers. Well, what, what, Wooler, have you got a beer at the moment or? Uh, no, I don't at the moment. Um, I did have one earlier. Um, I can get another one. I've had a taste of that 35. Well, I'm not going to force you to have a beer. 
But I heard Taste that 35. Um, and I'm going to add a few drops of water to that. Actually, a, a generous dash because it's, uh, it's a big whiskey. And see how that reacts with a bit of water. I'm always skipped. I'm always funny about um, adding water to uh, to sherry or you know rich, deep, rich dried fruit whiskies. Julian Billy Viard says, "G'day, g'day, mate. Good to see you, mate." Um, and Mark Teague says, "Just like retail stores, ignore the, the in-store customer for the phone calls." No. <laughs> 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 uh. Mm, that's showing up quite nicely now. I added a fair dash to that. How's that? Th- how's that? Um, how's that seven dot one two eight coming along, Steve? <laughs> Mate, it is massive. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's got it's got a lot of oak on it, but not in a bad way. Um, I don't know if you're on board, Matt. When I when I mentioned it, it's a seven dot one two eight, a thirty year old. At fifty four percent, yeah, right. Um, and for thirty years, it's it's big, it's big. Yeah, it's it's. You said it was a big whiskey, and you you what kind of glass are you using for it? Out of interest, uh, it's a plume, a plume oh, yeah. glass. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's kind of big with a, a nice opening, so I can get me massive beak in there. <laughs> but also wide enough that I don't have to tilt my head back and suffer from soft tissue damage to get it into my mouth. <laughs> There's actually like some chocolate sort of cherry ripe notes coming off it as well as. Um, That's sounding good. Yeah. Some really it's, it's, it's good Oak. Like it's not overbearing or drying or tannic or anything like that. So it's actually, it's, it's really well balanced. I don't go for those older ages, uh, the society. I like the I like the youth in society whiskey. So I normally will sit around the like seven, eight, ten year old sort of releases. I'm not sure when this was released, but I don't I don't see too many thirty year old bottlings coming through at the moment. I think that's the the state of the landscape, though, isn't it? More it, than it, anything uh, else, that, that, that's a that's a symptom of the industry, isn't it? Really, more than anything, it's like you don't see you don't see too many 30, 35 year old single cask whiskeys at the moment. I mean, it's just no. the popularity of whiskey is just outstripping supply. Really. It's yep. why the distilleries are like we've seen with Glen Livet, with McAllen, uh, with Elsa Bay, all those distilleries that are ramping up production to cope with demands on, on their spirit. And I, you know, it's like, look at the new McAllen. It's ridiculous. It's so it's like, you know, and I love that. Like, I love that it's happening. Um, at the same time. Yeah. It's, you know, markets that, you know, especially markets like like China, like Taiwan, uh, that typically were big on uh, rice wines, were typically big on cognac, uh, and now discovering whiskey, and they're, they're very big in those markets now as well. So mm. it's not just a it's not just a drink that your old man drinks anymore. And uh, it's good to good to see uh, young whiskies, eight, nine, ten year olds coming through to prove a point that they can be really good at a young age mm, mm. And, and not necessarily Isla whiskies, which seem to perform better at a lower age anyway, by default, because they've, just, yeah. they've got that. That's, that's what they're about. You know, they're, they're fiery, they're brash, they're, they're bold. Yeah. And maybe the cask has had something to say, but maybe it doesn't really matter when you've got Pete involved. Well, that's, a, that's like um, whenever I see those, 25, 20, 25 year old uh, Lefroids coming through in society. And it's just like boring to me. Like the flavor, they're well made whiskies and they're very well looked after. But it's like, you know, these distilleries, they really do perform the, the way they make their whiskies perform at those young ages. Like there's so much more excitement to be had. Uh, it's great that, you know, society is doing like 25 year old Lefroids and things like that. But whenever I get to taste them, it's like, no, you know what? It just tells me even more and more how well those those whiskies are when they're young. Those mm. when they're young. Look, realistically, there's going to be arguments both sides of the Isla coin, for want of a better term. You're going to get some old Lafroigs that are really on top of things, and you're going to get some old Coolilas that are just beautiful that still have a light sort of peat or ash sort of thing coming through. Yeah, but by the by the same token. Um, 
Octomores, whether you like it or not, or Port Charlotte seem to work when they're under 10, 12 years old. Yeah. On the flip side of that, however, on the flip side of that, Steve, I have often thought about this and it's like, how many, like, okay, you taste, a, there's a lot of Peter whiskey out there that's like five, eight, nine years old, et cetera. And it's, and it's some of it, well, a lot of it is very good. Okay. Mm. How much of that is good whiskey because it's able to hide behind peat? Yeah. And I, I, I'm always just thinking about that a little bit. It's like, it's, it's a bit like, it's a bit like a, a terrible beer can hide behind a lot of hops. <laughs> yeah, it's like, you know, it's like, oh, this beer's not doing very well. Let's, um, uh, um, you know, let's, let's, you know, throw heaps of hops at it. And it's the same with like, you know, it's not the same, but it's like, if you, if you have a whiskey that's heavily peated and it's five years old, uh, you can hide a lot of flaws with peat. If, that's for sure. I don't know. I just feel like you can hide a lot of flaws with it. I could be in the minority on that one, but I, I don't know, but I, it's one of those things I'm always just aware of. Um, Jose, welcome to the chat. I should have welcomed you two minutes ago. Sorry, I just got involved in that. Oh, good. How are you, man? Good to see you, mate. Hope you're well. Yeah, thanks, man. Good. Does everyone here know well. Jose? Does everyone here know Jose? Uh, yeah, Hi, yeah. Jose. We 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 made around. I know, I know the bearded man, and of course, <laughs> Matt. You know, yeah. Yeah, excellent. Uh, so you, you're you're at the shop tonight, and you've got a, your own tasting at eight o'clock, have you? Yeah, we got a we got a private tasting for um for our for our team. Um, Starting yeah, like half an hour, so um, working working late this this Friday. Uh, actually, feels like going yeah. out. Yeah, That's we it. all feel like going out, man. Come on, <laughs> <laughs> you going out? I can't even we go drink. We're on Zoom on a Friday night. I mean, that's that's the new reality. That's going out. That's You're the lucky. New reality, exactly. That's as good as it's going to get. Yeah, yeah. No, that's okay. That's okay. Uh, Caleb says, uh, "Loving the collection, Jose." He's talking about the wall behind you there. Oh, thank you. That's, I know that I know what that is behind you. That's uh, some of your personal stash, and, and it looks yeah. great behind you as well. Yes, it's a bit of um, it's a bit of everything in here. There's, uh, this 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 twenty seconds delay. So yeah, um, no, that's all right. That's all right. There is a it bit. It puts of- the IKEA shelving to shame, doesn't it, Mister Bailey? <laughs> the TV, too many TVs. <laughs> Ikea shelving, don't don't knock it. Uh, that's what I'm talking about. Yeah, I, I can see it. Yeah, that's we all right. have Ikea shelving. Good stuff. We all, we all have had Ikea shelving. I know. See, my my collection sits on like proper oak bookcases that are, that are not from Ikea, but the, <laughs> the rest of the, the work stuff and everything else around here sits on Ikea. But um, it's sort of bookshelves on both sides of the room. But that side, there's I, nothing wrong with Ikea, man. It's all uh, about, it's all about but, presentation. I always I always um uh self. Uh, I always pre-fortify my IKEA shelving. Wise policy. Yeah. Oh, I got like little brackets and like 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 properly yeah. like fortify the shelving with like metal hinges and brackets before I while I'm assembling it. I and so that, is, that is something I see very often on 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 photos of collections on the on on online when people post, especially people that use um, glass shelves. Oh my um, god! Yeah. You're scaring me. <laughs> Yeah. I, see, I see, see it all too often. Like these these collections, like these glass cabinets that are designed for jewelry, and they've put like uh, thirty yeah. kilos of bottles on each shelf, and they're like, and then you see this photo of smashed bottles in a line, and half the bottles or, are smashed uh, It's like, or, or, or a box of a Macallan, just a box, a wooden box of a Macallan. It's like you know, a kilo and a half extra. You know, it's um, yeah, they look beautiful, you know, but you know, it's uh, yeah, uh, reinforcing shelves is very very important. Oh Funny yes. Way, yeah. It's and funny enough, many of the, the collectors that I know, they just have industrial shelves. Yeah, it looks like so ugly. But yeah, just, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, those like those Bunning style, like sort of industrial yeah. shelves that some people yeah. store them on. Yeah, exactly. I'm gonna put a better camera so they can can get more front. So, what you guys are drinking tonight? I'm having a Pilsner and a Glen Murray. Nice, nice. Um, I'm, I'm on a. Uh, Quiet Deeds, New England IPA. And I'm the only one that doesn't drink beer at the moment. Matt, you had a beer. No, uh, I've got a beer. I've got a, I've got the beach coma here now. So I've filled up with a bit of beach coma. Mm. Nice. It's got a very strong um, banana-esque nose to it. There's a lot of Campbelltown in that in that there, uh, Matt. That's um, there's a Campbelltown on Highland casks in that mix. Mm. Yeah. 
This is one of these um, these sort of like limited release bottlings that have come out from society. <laughs> oh yeah, they're, yeah, they come. I <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, just had one of those moments. Like I sincerely hope no one from the UK was watching just then. <laughs> it's just a promotional ghetto edition. <laughs> it's a sample bottle. Come on, sample bottle. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, very cool. Um, uh, Caleb asks, did you make sure it's all parafilmed and lined up perfectly? The hand in the hand in hand Lafroig is crazy good. Yeah, well, that was a great Lafroig. Yeah, wow, well, we love the Lafroig hand in hand. That was that's a really good buy too. Quite cheap. That was the time we could buy Lafroig for you know under two hundred bucks for single cask. It's amazing. That does that doesn't happen anymore. Yeah, a bit like our May out term, where there's one for under two hundred. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, if you don't, you would say Lafroig in the front, you know. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Uh, I, uh, win some, lose some. No, I like the coding. That's fine. It keeps it. It keeps it all. I even. love the coding. It's amazing. Yeah, it keeps you know, it I think it's a very smart way to 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 um yeah. to have the the engage the people. You know, yeah, yeah, a bit of fun, exactly. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And you also don't need to pay full price for casks. <laughs> well, it's, it all it all it all transfers on. Kelvin, La Kelvin Lowe, good to see you, mate. Kelvin's in the house. Good to see you, Kelvin. Hope everything's well for you, mate, in, um, in, uh, with Elysian and everything going on there. Mm. Uh, very cool. Robert Aker says, dry hop. I'm going to see if there's, any, if there's any other comments coming through on the um, other channel because I've been abandoning it. I'm sorry. Talk amongst yourselves. Um, Has everyone else thought what they're going to do the first day when these – Quarantine finishes and this lockout finishes. Are you ready? Oh, yeah. I'm like, I've already got, I've already got uh, planned out. No, I've got it planned out perfectly already. A bottle to open or like uh, you know. No, I'm getting a, I'm getting a pub. I'm getting a pub schnitzel and a pint. I don't think I don't think there'll be an official day when it stops. I don't think there'll be an official. It'll just sort of creep in. Mm. Yeah, creep through. Well, the creep point for me is when my pub opens again, my local, so I can get a Palmer and a pint. That's true. Just sit, there, just sit down and oh. on a shared table, you know, that would be enough. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sit down on a shared table and, and enjoy a few, um, a few, oh, lots of things coming in here. I've been missing all these comments. Sorry, guys. Look out, finish. Are you Where are we? Oh, you're going to be right? up perfectly already. A bottle Thank to you. open or like, uh, no, no. No, I'm opening all the good stuff now. I don't need to, I don't need to wait till quarantine's over. I've been in a bottle oh, opening mood. Celebration. Okay, man. Yeah, celebration. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, oh, maybe. I mean, like, like Willa said, I don't think it's going to be like a, an exact moment where it's like, yeah, uh, like the and, and we're open again. I think it's just going to be a creep, and I think it's everything. Well, let's put it like this, Matt. The first proper tasting that you can do, host again. You know, yeah. that would be a big one. You know, the same with us. We would do something big. The first time we can host yeah. again. A tasting, you know, in the store. Oh yeah, a big party for our members. That's gonna be something to open, something nice, you know. That's, yeah, that's that's the thing I'm missing the most is just having the the the, the customers, the chat, the panther, you know. Yeah. When you finish the tasting, stand up, continue drinking, open a beer, you know. Yeah. That, that. yeah. It's it's the big format events I'm already missing. You know, like when we had like 100 people at the RAC or 100 people at the Kelvin Club or something in Melbourne. Yeah. There's, there's large format ones where we have all these members coming in together and drinking good whiskey. It's like, those are the things I've, oh, I've missed. Um, uh, here we go. Um, Jeff Darby, we we're talking about age statements before about young whiskeys and you know, there's how a lot of whiskeys can excel at younger ages. Jeff Darby says, I got over the age statement a long time ago. Cool comment from Jeff. Um, Ah, Ryan says you can't hide shit beer or whiskey behind peat or hops. Uh, you can cover a pile of dung with a blanket. There's still going to be a pile of dung. <laughs> ah. I appreciate that comment. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and uh, Andrew Cuff says... They, they the example of the famous lowland distillery that keeps yeah. two woods, three woods, four woods. 25 woods. <laughs> <laughs> you know, oh, it tastes the same. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, One point is like making 20 teas with the same bag, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
Uh, Gary says he's had some amazing young Lefroigs. Yeah, agreed. I mean, it's uh, we're talking before about how you know young spirit excels, uh, uh, like young Peter's spirit. He seems to excel at a young age. Like, and Lefroig is one of those distillates, I believe, actually does. Uh, but it it does it does it does develop a different character in the older ages as well. Like Lefroig after it's 20 years, 22, 25 years of age, develops a different character. It's not the same, but it's still a lovely whiskey. It's just oh yeah, you lose the you lose the quite often you're losing that smoke, you're losing that yeah. ash element, uh, and it's in you're like gaining that. a lot lots of tropical fruits and and old old oak, yeah. which is lovely. Yeah, exactly. I, I don't think it's just gain. It just doesn't lose it. You know, just keeps it there, and what volatile the volatiles are the peat. It's just what left, and then the, it's just. That that that's just Lafro. It's, it's you know it's his own it's his own beast. It's 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 one of my yeah, favorite yeah, yeah. distilleries. You know, it's, uh, Springman is another distillery that made mythical. They're eighty years old. You know uh, those old pear shaped uh, eighty years old. They were absolutely stunning. You know uh, well, a lot has changed in the production of whiskey in that time. I mean, like yeah. look at those bottlings of like Glen Grant five year old from the from the nineteen yeah. seventies and whatnot, like nineteen sixties. Yeah. They were sort of five. They were labeled as five year old. Uh, Glen Grant, yeah, and I was, and I think they're mostly Italy market or something. Um, with a with a plastic top. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. but they they were unbelievable whiskies, and it's well, I mean, uh, I don't know how much of that is old bottle effect and how much is that is rose tinted glasses and all that kind of thing. But like you just go, they were great whiskies, and so how much of that you know? What, obviously, production differences have changed a lot since then. Air Maybe drum. they knew it was good whiskey. That's why they put it out at five years old. Yeah. 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 I saw that decision of Ardbeg to put out a, a core range five year old uh, recently, uh, the Wee Beastie, as they're calling it, or something, a, a core range Ardbeg. Yeah. I mean, I'm interested I, to see how that performs. That's a commercial decision that the, all the Isla Distillery has been working for years now on releasing younger younger whiskies, you know, with the Cal Calilla doing the mock, um, you know, all the non-age statements. So now everyone's used to young, vibrant peat. You know, you probably come with a five year old five, six years ago, and it would have not worked. Today, everyone's had no problem. They already tasted many, many, many young, young. Yeah, well, young they tasted girls. many, many young whiskeys, but a lot of them have, haven't had an age statement. Correct. But, but Isla as a, as a whole thing, you know, you already know it's young. I think they've been working together to, to, to making everyone um, uh, be yeah, ready. So, so when they release a 15-year-old whiskey, it's suddenly now it's instead of being Two hundred dollars. It's now one thousand because you can get away with that now. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. The, the marketing side of it, is, you know, put that aside for a minute. I think the educated public is probably more willing to accept a five-year-old whiskey now than they would have been maybe four, five, six years ago. Oh yeah. Everyone, yeah. everyone. There's a lot more educated consumers out there now, and putting a five-year-old age statement on a bottle should it should be commended. But I think it can be a, a lot easily accepted because people understand how it all works now. Mm. Yes. And also saying that, I think that the people that um, today is drinking these five-year-olds and these non-age statements, because of the price of the whiskey right now, they, yeah. they have not a lot of experience with you know 20, 25, 30-year-olds. You know, so it's it's because just the price now it becomes you know inaccessible pretty much. So, yep. you know, your idea of speed and complexity at, at five years old is, is one, but most of that people have not been able to access or will not be able to access for, for you know, the foreseeable future. Uh, uh, 25 year olds, you know, what's the laughter you're going to have a 25 year old today? It's prohibitive. You know, 30 year old, not even think about it. You know, and what single cask? People, do people know what Lafroy single cask official bottling looks like? or? You know, <laughs> so, even at that age, it's just uh, unaffordable totally today. You know, so yeah, that is that is true. Uh, if, if it was an official bottling, the, some of these releases that indies get to put out, like we do, um, of these distilleries, they'd be absurdly priced. Mm. Like that oh. new, that, did you see that new that new Ardbeg, uh, twenty five year old? I saw a sneak photo of the the silver and black yeah. bottle. That it's yeah, yeah. Like I I can't wait to see what that's priced at. If that's anything less. Than twelve hundred dollars a bottle, I am going to eat a shoe, but don't. Uh, you know what? <laughs> I'm just going to hold me to that. I won't do it live on camera. Sorry, guys. No, no, no luck. Um, uh, Darren Howie up in Queensland raises a very valid point of saying Kilhoman has blasted through that barrier, re releasing a great list 
of young whiskey. Uh, I, I think I've said on my stream before that I think Kilhoman is one of those distilleries that it, so far seems like it excels at a younger age. Uh, and the same could be said about distillers like Springbank. I think you mentioned before, Jose. Springbank is one of those distillers that excels at, a, at an older age. You can't compare the Kilcoman with Springbank. No, it's like you can't but, change. But like the, they, their distillate seems to react at a different at a different age and different level. Also, Kilcoman has been uh, has been engineered with current uh, technology, so you know, very difficult today to to start up a new, a new distillery and come up with a very bad product. There's yep. a lot more knowledge. There's a lot more research on on shape of steel, sizes, uh, prime matter, uh, production process, and everything. So it's pretty easy to come up with young malts today, starting from scratch. Whether well, imagine yourself trying to start a distillery back on the, you know, twenties, thirties, uh, you know, fifties, uh, trial and error, pretty much. Yeah. At that time. Yeah. Jose, what do you yes. what do you know about the stills that they've just put in at Kilhoman? The second pair of stills are they designed to produce a spirit that will eventually be geared towards longer aging as opposed to the stills that are sort of being commissioned for one of a better term under jim swan to produce a whiskey that's going to work yeah. between five and ten years old i think it's um now it's 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 the probably the first upgrade they're doing you know a very small distillery that starts small and you cannot start with large scale production this is this is just to the, the unless first it's a grain upgrade. distillery. Again, Matt. Unless it's a grain distillery, then you can just start. Yes, it correct. Just, uh, they just started with like you know, two million liters <laughs> for the first month. But you know, this is the first upgrade. So happy to see. We'd love to see you come and uh, you know with 15, 18, 20 years old. You know, can't wait to, to see that how how it behaves. You know, um, that sort of more ashy, less marine, and yeah. And the, the, the philosophy of, of making everything in house. I'm just uh, wondering if they if they have they modeled the stills on the ones that were there originally, or are they completely different? I don't know. Honestly, I don't know. I don't know. It's uh, probably any any time you buy a new steel, it's uh, you're probably coming from a shape that you already know, and and faucets would just suggest that that's that's suitable for you. And from trial and error, many many decades you know mm. we were yesterday uh we did a tasting with millstone and they just bought two faucets ten thousand liters this is the third upgrade they're doing um you know amazing steels very tall big you know they we didn't get to talk with patrick we just production uh managers just to see just to ask him what he was looking when he bought the shape he bought right uh they took him they said it took him a year to to get these steels like the, the queue today in faucets is one year I'll just jump in here. We've got a comment from Ryan who said that um, Steve's comment about five-year-old age statements hit the nail on the head. But also another comment from Chris Cornell, who is a um, very, very knowledgeable distiller himself, who's commented and said that the second set of stills at Kilhoman are identical to their original ones. So yeah, Thank you, Chris. Identical in size? No, as in like in everything, in every aspect, I think. He's every sort of, aspect. Like a carbon copy of the existing stills. And I think that's a very wow. smart decision on Kilhoman's part of obviously to not uh, mess with the profile of what the, of their current spirit and get as close as possible to the, to, to repeating that. Um, it's also like, you know, when you, when you look at distilleries like Yamasaki that they have what's so five steels, they are all different. Oh yeah. 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 I was, that's what, that's what I was going to say before you go to Yamasaki and then you go up to Hakushu and you go into, into their still rooms and yeah, they've got like a row of, I'm sure if Dan Woolley was on here, he'd be able to confirm, but um, just from my head, it's like you would see two rows of six, and out of those, every second still is a different shape. Yeah. Like I've got and different different heights, different necks, the whole deal. They 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 keep on adding on a different style. Mm. I remember I had a I had a private tour at, at, um, at Yamasaki Distillery, and I asked the 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 tour person, I said, "Is there a favorite still?" And he said, "Yes, number three. Most of the people in the in the distillery agree that number three is the one that gives the 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 favorite spirit of the of the for the you know for the workers. Uh, but obviously they 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 all um, uh, acknowledge that they are all different and they all have their benefits and they all have their um, you know not so good um, characteristics. That's also part of the good thing of having different steels, you know, just being able to produce different 
different styles, you know, yeah. unless you have a weird process like Springbank. Spring the shape line. of the stills at Glen Finnick are all, all different as well. Yeah, yeah, mm. yeah. That's yeah. right. And every distiller would say will have a, his favourite still, you know. Uh, a comment from Tom Scott, who said, who's um, who's hugely knowledgeable in this stuff as well, and uh, actually works for um, the Exchange slash Beam Suntory these days. Tom says uh, all the all at Hackershoe, all the wash stills are different, and the um, the and produce about thirty different styles of whiskey. So it's um, uh, that that sort of uh, makes the how many styles? It's like what 14, 13 different styles of whiskey over at Loch Lomond. To seem a bit sort of paltry in comparison, doesn't it? Um, just out of curiosity, what what difference would the the wash stills being different shapes make? I'm that's a very not knowledgeable point. enough to sort of fathom how that would have any impact. Yeah, I mean, the size would probably really make an impact. Same as spirit steel, you know, you you increase or decrease reflux, so basically limiting the amount of aromas and mm -hmm. and um, components that you can get, you know. Um, I have a, I have a, I have a really nice picture about, you know, do you, do you, you picture reflux, how it works, right? So this, the, 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 the smaller steel, less reflux, the, the bigger the steel, more reflux is um, kind of reflux you can define it as the, um, how much trouble it takes a molecule to pass over to the distillate. So if the steel is very dull, a molecule of certain size will take a lot more energy. And also if the neck is curved, We'll be bouncing around, get reflux, get to the neck, and reflux back into the pot. So it will never pass on the other side. So um, the both 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 spirits just vary on uh, how how much reflux do we basically want, you know, for aromatics. Um, Darren also says, uh, Darren Howie says, one thing we picked up when he was one thing he picked up when he was touring these distilleries was every neck shape, size, angle, etc., all make a difference, which is true. Um, and every distiller thinks that their setup is the best. Uh -huh. <laughs> yes, true. But technically, any, even a dent will make a difference, you know. Yeah. We change all the kinetics of the of the distillation. We change the the, the way that all the particles move around the steel. Um, dents, um, you know, anything. Then the how high is the neck? The yeah. inclination of the neck, you know. Glamorangi is very tall steels, and that's why it produces very, very, very light spirit. The reflux is massive, so the bigger particles that take a lot of energy to distill, they they never pass to the other side. So only the lighter particles pass to the other side. Mm. It's just physics. You know? mm. um, I guess until you until you build it and you turn it on, you can never know. You know. Yeah. No. Oh, yeah. 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 And that's why I mean, once they find out what their profile is and what they're building, um, that'll obviously change everything again. Did you uh, pour another see, sneaky like, dram there, Matt? Yeah, I, I did. I did. <laughs> Good work. Yeah, yeah. You can see distilleries, the new distilleries like Amrut and Gavalan and Aran, you know, um, mm. how tailored the spirit is. A lot yeah. more tailored than, than it's, you know, they, 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 they are almost faultless, you know. You can't yeah, find yeah. fault on those whiskeys. You know, you might not like them or dislike them, but there's no faults. There's no, you know, florals like crazy... <laughs> Uh, Bamos from the eighties style appearing from there. No, 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 no. no. You know, super massive. Uh, I don't know, hot edges on those, on those. Uh, um, but do you think that's that? That sort of leads into sort of like a, a the problem of where <laughs> this is a really esoteric question, but some of those faults that we they say, like you're saying, like distillers like Cavalan, like Amrut, like all these like the New World. Uh, mega distillers that are doing great stuff, uh, Aran, um, even Lag, I guess, coming up as well. Um, do you think that they're going to be, by not having those faults, they're going to be, they're going to miss out on some of those edges that make some of the spirit so exciting? Oh well, but, yes, I totally agree with that. Yes. As in, like, I if agree. you look at Bamor from the '60s, as you said, yes. it's like, you know, some of those, some of the whiskey, some of the spirit that came out of the 1960s Bamor was inherently flawed. Uh, as, as you know, it was it, but it, yeah, the product it produced at the end was incredible because of its flaws, it had so much character. Whereas, it's like, the flaws are variation, and out of it's, it's like a your crazy Picasso that cuts his, cuts his ear off, you know, in his craziness, he makes mm, that was Vincent Van Gogh, 
<laughs> Van Gogh, sorry, not Picasso. <laughs> just like Van Gogh. You know, in, this, in, his, in, his, in the craziness of, of these flaws appear just the, the, and that's when it comes all up to the single cask, the magic of the single cask that you cannot replicate, you know, and it's just one cask out of 1,000 mm. that is just stunning. And what, what is different there? Who knows? Yeah. You know? well, and that's, and that's, those... yeah, that, of course, that's the challenge in, the, in, in finding great single casks to bottle, but it's, of course, even just dialing back to the spirit level of that. Um, I mean, Steve, you can probably attest to this. Like it's some of the, some of the most interesting whiskeys you've tried. And I know, and I've even been in the same company as you when we've tried them have been ones where they've been uh, inherently flawed, but in a good way. It's like they've, they've been the Vincent van Gogh of whiskeys in a way. Gentlemen, I, I'm sorry, there are, I need to go. Because you need to go. Sorry. Me Jose, I'll see you uh, soon. Thank you very much for joining. I'm happy to do this every... Uh, All right, this is the Friday Night Drinks. Friday, Friday Night, night drinks, drinks. Every Friday. Here we do I've been, it. I've been, I've been dying to come in and, and, and bump into your tastings, man. <laughs> oh, mate, mate. <laughs> always, always a pleasure. Always good to see you. Thank you so much, Jose. Take Cheers, care, Jose. Jose. Bye. Have a good one. Um, so, yeah. Uh, Steve, what, what's your thoughts on that? Well, I think, I think flaws in whiskey, it's, it's I mean, all open right, to right, interpretation. I mean, they're not, not they're, flaws, they're but not like, flaws. They're not flaws. They're not flaws. They're not flaws, but they're, they're, they're uh, extreme characteristics sometimes. Yeah. You like they're, yeah. I, think, I think that's probably part and parcel of the beauty of whiskey. Have you guys got mozzies in Sydney? What's going on? You're all waving uh, your hands around. Know, it's, like a moth, it's like a moth or something. I don't know what it is. <laughs> I've got too many lights on. <laughs> Matt Wool is gone. Um. As far as as far as one person's flaws as another person's entertainment, do you know what I mean? Yeah, I know what you mean. Yeah. I think uh, <laughs> if we if we all like, you know, it always comes back to that old adage: if we all like the same whiskey, it'd be pretty boring. Did you just spray fly spray wooler? <laughs> You're not going to be. A- uh, good luck nosing your dram for the next hour. <laughs> yeah. My goodness. Oof. I guess I guess it's open to interpretation, Matt, about what what people consider a flaw and what people consider something desirable in a whiskey. Um, and it comes down to personal preference. Um, I'm not a big fan of heavily sherried whiskies because I can't determine what the spirit character is like most of the time in those sort of drams. Yeah, um, but they all seem uh, there are a, a big segment of the community that love the sherry bombs. Yeah, I, I'm actually in the same boat as you, Steve. I've I've got a lot of friends who in the whiskey world, and you know, is in like friends who enjoy good whiskey. <clears throat> better way to say that, um, who are massive sherry heads, and mm. they love their sherry whiskeys. They obsess over the, you know, the 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 Glendronachs and Macallans, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and they love that sort of those all that stuff. And I, I'm sort of, I love sherried whiskeys. I don't get me wrong. I love a good sherried whiskey, but I, I really don't care for them as much as I think most of the people I know. I'm not answering any more calls. Cause that's the same number as last time. Sorry. Cause there's Scotty. Um, <laughs> trying to call me again. I was going to say, if, if we've got Scotty dialing in, if you've got any, any questions about skills, he will make that up. He'll make that shit up. And he was making up as we go along. Yeah. It. Yeah. He'll make it up as we go along. <laughs> I, I'm sorry. I'm not answering that one. Um, look, I can't be, I can't be sure it was the same one as last time. Maybe. <laughs> Um, there's a comment, great comment here from Tom Scott, previously from Whiskey and Almond, who now works at Exchange slash Beam Suntory. Uh, great guy. Uh, he says, sometimes the flaws make it special. If you remember Cannons on the Broadside or something called something like that, I think he's referring to Broadside Cannon Barrage, 27.112. Um, uh, the 21-year-old Springbank from SMWS. Oh, yes, yeah, he's, he's, it was amazing, uh, but had some flaws, which in my mind made it more interesting. Yes, that, that was a a very polarizing whiskey in some ways and was one of my favorite uh, older uh, springers that we've seen through. But um, yeah, it's, it's, I know what you mean, Tom. It's, it's like finding these, those flaws, if you like, all those, you know, those, those bits on the edge of the spirit, which make it interesting rather than just being a uniform, smooth, straight up and down kind of whiskey. Um, I think, I think uh, with that particular whiskey, you've got to, you've got to, incorporate the backstory with it as well mm. and i think maybe the flaws that make it interesting or divisive are part of that backstory like was that the cast that the australian gentleman owned and there was a bit of a bidding war between 
Springbank and the society to, to get hold of it? That's the, the first part of that is correct. That was a, it was a Melbourne based member who owned that cask, that particular cask. Yeah. Who then um, uh, sold the cask to me. And then I, <laughs> and then I um, didn't know what to do with 572 bottles of Springbank. So <laughs> it's sort of like, well, uh, I think the society could bottle this. I think it's worthy of it. Of course, it went through the same panel process as any other cask that goes past. So it was like, it had to be approved by panel and they dosed it and they tasted it and they thought it was very good. So like, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you for clarifying the backstory there. Yeah, um, it's a cool story though, behind that particular cask. It's like, you know, yeah. that was, a, you know, it's Andrew, Andrew, Andrew and I, both of us, at least once a month or once every two months, we get a phone call or a message or something that says, oh, I've got a cask for sale. And um, would the society like to buy it? And it's always like, okay, what is it? And a lot of the time it's like, oh, it's a, it's a refill Linkwood or it's a refill Mortlac or it's a refill Brooklady or something that has, uh, with those, all those cask buying schemes and it's a private cask they've picked up or bought it off a broker or something like that. And 99.9% of the time it's like, no, that's fine. Don't worry. That's fine. Uh, it don't, it's like, we've got a lot of access to a lot of the, the, the obviously the Asia distilleries in terms of great casks. So buying a inflated private cask uh, of, of a refill liquid isn't much fun, mm. but that member uh, <laughs> in Melbourne, uh, he, he called, he called me up and, and said, um, uh, Oh, I've got a cask for sale. <laughs> and I said, Hey, what is it? And he said, it's a 21 year old uh, spring bank. I said, it was a pause on the phone. I said, do you want to go again? Do you want to say what distillery it is again? So I didn't quite catch that. He said, it's a 21 year old spring bank. It's a sherry, butt, a spring bank. I said, Nah, nah, nah. You, how do you just have that? And he said, "Oh, I, I, I filled it myself in 1996." Right. What a great but, story. <laughs> it's just awesome. Like he was at the distillery mid 90s. They were still doing uh, private sales of casks there, so he just filled up sherry butt. And, and I said, "Uh, I said that's very awesome." And, I, and he was talking about something else. And he said, oh, "My only regret was that I didn't buy ten of them." I just got the one. Yeah, probably, probably only paid 500 pounds for the fill. And yeah, probably something like that. I mean, he showed me the original invoice. It was a fair bit more than that, but it's still like enough that you go, yeah, I should have got 10 of those. <laughs> <laughs> so it was like, uh, yeah, but there was a bidding. There was a bit of a bidding war. You are correct. Um, back and forth. And it got, it got, a, it got a little bit, um, a little bit interesting there, but it worked out in the end. Mem and then members could get access to it. And I just, I had that, I had that worry personally of if I was to bottle it as me, it would sort of be like one of those things like, where do I even start? Um, you know, all those kind of things. And what would I do with 600 bottles on my hands? So it's a big undertaking for an individual. It is. It is a big undertaking for an individual that doesn't have a global membership. And it was sort of like, well, I think it should be a society cask. I think it's very good. And the panel passed it with flying colors. Um, Lockie says the spring bank was amazing. I shamefully didn't get myself one. Lachlan, I've got a bottle here. You can share mine. Don't worry. Um <clears throat> Yeah, Joel, I still do have a bottle of it. Of course, I just said, yeah, I've still got one here. So, um, you know, anyone who wants to drop in, it's always, or well, don't drop in right now, you know. <laughs> yeah. COVID and all that, but anyway. <laughs> um, <laughs> oh, uh, also, Whiskey and Wisdom's edition two of Glenn Farkless is a great example of a pure sherry space side. Yep. Uh, depending on my mood, it lacks the guts and interest on a whiskey that has flaws. That being said, amazing and complex for a pure whiskey. It's a very interesting point. I mean, I don't think the only flaw that you can find in a sherry cask is sulfur. I think there's obviously other flaws in there, like, uh, of course, youthfulness and age and faintiness and or over oaked and all sorts of things. And but yeah, sulfur is obviously a, a much discussed one. Um, <laughs> makes the cage at Cadenheads in Campbelltown seem lame. <laughs> I don't mean it to. Sorry. Um, uh, <laughs> and uh, P.S. from Darren Howie to Matt Wooler. Uh, our Cav Millie is barking at your pups. No. <laughs> dogs. Dogs. Yeah. Dogs are getting excited over Zoom as well. <laughs> this is the new world that we live in. This is, my, this is my day when I'm working at home, which is just every day at the moment because I lecture at UNSW, so it's all home thing, which, of course, is my luck. Today was my last day of term, thank God, for a while. Yeah. Uh, is uh, this, these dogs all day. It doesn't stop. It quite literally doesn't stop. It's endless energy. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, Ryan says, uh, this segment is proudly sponsored by Mortine. <laughs> no, I did get that. I did get that tin from uh, Aldi. <laughs> Sorry, Aldi team. Right, good. Very good. Very good. 
it doesn't work anywhere near as Mortino. I can guarantee you that. Yeah. So Jeff it's Darby, not- Jeff Darby here in the comments says he uh, he loves his port influenced whiskies. What are your guys' takes on port fin- port finishes or port maturation? I I enjoy uh, quite a few port finishes. I, it, it's I they come and go sometimes, but. Uh, it's like uh, my last tasting before lockdown be- and Matt came along to that one is I opened an older bottle of uh, Glenrangi Quinta Ribbon and it was absolutely delicious. So that's the pork cast finish. And um, I shared it around the neighborhood here. So my neighbors across the road, they're interested yeah. in whiskey. Uh, of course, you know, I pour them a nice dram and they just get the whole glass and just knock it back like they do. But the um, everyone loves it. Like it's it's a really nice sort of uh, pull cast whiskey, and I, I love those ones. But uh, sometimes I find them a little bit too much, like uh, rose petals. Too much rose petal happens in a pull cast. Yeah. Okay. And for you, Steve, uh, pull cast for me, hit hit and miss. Um, I had a really good example of an overream pull cast at cast or sixty percent thereabouts, which was fantastic. Um, lots of dark fruit flavors, nice soft oak elements to it um and the other extreme i've had some port cast example from campbelltown that have been really meaty and overbearing and heavy on the oak and australian ones uh no these this is from campbelltown right um they've just been super heavy on the on the port influence and personally not that enjoyable so i think it's a fine line between i think i think Personally, the, per, uh, uh, the best example, or well, not example, but the best situation is to have it in bourbon first, then maybe finish it in port. That's personal preference. Mm. So that the port doesn't overpower or the wood that the port's been in doesn't overpower. I, I can safely say I've never had a fully matured port cask whiskey that I've enjoyed. Mm. Yeah, yeah, I think we, I might we, struggle to say the same. Even though even that Quinta Reuben I'm talking about, that's still ten years original style, so ex bourbon cask. Mm. Then it's being finished for two years in port cask. It's not a one hundred. That seems like a more sensible arrangement. You know, uh, one of my one of my uh, I still say this. I've said this n- numerous times. If people ask me what you know, what whiskeys are great, you know, what whiskeys are great for beginners to getting into the category, I still reference Glenmorangie as as one of them. And not, and I never, I never go to the finishes. I just say Glen Range original. I think it's a great whiskey. Mm. It's just so. Uh, it's even now. I still, in, I, you know, surrounded by single cast whiskey. I still enjoy a Glen Range original. I think it's a, a great whiskey. Well, you, um, you, you, when, whenever Doctor Bill's out, you talk to him about uh, the Glen Orange range, and his proudest moments are the core cool range. That's what he, he's so happy about. He yeah. Talks about the the sort of marketing versions that come out mm. afterwards. Yeah. He doesn't talk anywhere near as much um, sort of love and 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 uh, passion as what he does with those those original releases. I mean, I remember when they changed over from the old labeling, and there was a, there were there were flavor changes that that came through as well. And um, and he he talks about those that newer labeling style as being the the types that he's he's most um. Uh, it's still re- it's still about. ridiculously balanced and sweet and lovely yeah. and. Yeah. and- and approachable. Um, Still priced really well at about seventy bucks a bottle or something, sixty nine dollars a bottle, is it? Or probably uh, now. It edges about eighty these days, but yeah, it's right. it, you see it on special sometimes. Um, yeah. Gary says, uh, "Spot on, Steve." That's what Hobart Distillery do. And Rob Aker says, "Starwood had a good projects portwood." I can't remember the projects portwood. Um, I know Steve and I have got a fair few projects, but I don't remember the portwood one. I must. There's probably there's, there's been a few I've missed. Don't worry. Um. Do you remember that one, Steve? I don't know. Am I missing one? No, not 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 straight off the bat. No, no. Um, unless that, unless you're referring to the tawny or something, the the tawny there. Um, what do you think of the Glenmorangie Nectar Ore? Is the question from Joey. To me? Yeah, all of us. Um, I think I think the Nectar Dior is the um, the lesser of the family. No? Uh, in in my in my th- I don't know. It's it's sort of like it's too much sweetness to it if you want to push it that yeah, sure. oh, yeah it's, it's i think that's just pushing it it's pushing it a little bit little bit far in the in the profile but i know a lot of people that love it and they love that sort of madeira cake style flavors that it has and it does have a really strong cakey cakey element to it and i, I haven't um, tried that one matt wooler what's the what's the cask makeup in that 
and that's what uh, does so anyone know? It's still, it's still 10 years in ex bourbon and then two years minimum in um, Saturn cask. Mm -hmm. But even, I think, um, Dr. Bill, when the last time he was out, Bill Lumsden was out, which was Matt, if you recall, when we were on that boat out in the harbor. In that oh, I, re I remember vividly. <laughs> and he doesn't talk as, as, uh, I think he was saying that Madeira casks are, um, are problematic to work with. He isn't as, I think if I'm re recalling correctly, it's not in his um, uh, something that he, that he sees as a... Uh, well, there's a good reason like why Madeira yeah. casks, rum casks, all these kind of things are yeah. not used as widespreadly in yeah. whiskey production. They're expensive yeah. and they're, they're hard to work with and the results are just too, too varied. It's, it's, it's too variable as a response. Um, same with like using pheno casks or using manzanilla cask. It's mm. like it's, it's too it's too much of a risk to mm. waste two hundred liters of spirit into something like that that ends up being a bit of a zombie. Um, Scott Fitzsimon says Quinta Rubin or bust. Uh, so he's obviously the big Quinta Rubin fan in that in that range. Good to see you. good to see you, Scott. Thanks for the prank calls earlier. I really appreciate it. Um, <laughs> Bridget says I had a wonderful uh, ten year old Ben Nevis port cask. Okay, yeah, I, I don't know that one, but. Can't do wrong with some Ben Nevis. Not lovely spirit. Uh, Jeff Darby says, however, a great whiskey on the night. The star can be any finish. I'm open to all tastings. It's good to keep an open mind, Jeff, especially with it's a great, it's a great mentality to keep on those kind of things. Um, and, uh, and he's, uh, and let me just go back to the other comments here. Um, no, Rob says, Rob Baker says, no, he's talking about an earlier new world white label. So one of the earlier bottlings, um, which was the port one. Uh, I think he, and then he says, unless I'm dreaming it, I mean, between, you know what, <laughs> I, I'm, I don't mean to throw Steve in the deep end on this, but uh, between, <laughs> between Steve and I, we probably have one of the most extensive newer project collections uh, from the early era, at least in my case. I'd, um, I'd be willing to wager we've got one of everything between us. In some cases too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, I, I, I certainly lost uh I won't say fell out of love with, but I'll say uh, lost f uh, favor with it. I guess uh, after after a, a while, um, there's I, I sort of dropped off a bit. Maybe uh, I mean before the white labels finished, but um, uh, not not that much before. I, and there was a few releases I missed out on, but purely because I I remember thinking uh, I definitely shouldn't spend that much on a um, a two year old whiskey. But there was this, there was sort of there was a few moments like that that happened. There was one which was like three fifty or four hundred dollars when it came out, and it was like there was like the the I think it was like the Baron House selection number one. Uh, you know, there's a few really expensive ones as well, and I sort of went, ah, uh, yeah. I think a couple of the Baron House ones were were pushing the the limits price wise. Not saying they weren't good whiskies or anything. No, no, but... no, no, not at all. Um, to dive in there because you just made me rem remember about this port cask I have, which I've been. I have had for years and um, I'm yet to open it. Uh, so this was 2017, this was hand bottled. Uh, oh, yeah. This is an old uh, Santos malt. Uh, oh, yeah. And it's a, it's a port cask. Yep. Uh, I've got a friend who, um, who lives over in um, Switzerland and he gets access to a lot of these ice caves that they have up there. Um, was that full maturation, that one? Yeah, so this is this is uh, no. It says port. It says port finish. Okay. But there's no other details on it apart from the fact that it's. Well, it's more. It's prob ninety five percent chance it's ex bourbon into yeah, port. Yeah, and forty eight percent age seven years. I have no idea. I have yet to open it. It's only five hundred mil. Um, looking forward to a day when I do open it. Uh, but yeah, for some reason I've withheld opening it, and I think it is because it's a port cast that I'm not as uh, willing to just dive in. Uh, I just I just don't get too excited over, like there's so many different wine and fortified casks I just don't care for. And I know that sounds really brash and like eliminates a lot of whiskey. I don't mean it to, because there's obviously a lot of wine casks that I do love as well, but I just get less excited over seeing things like like a, a like a port finish on a whiskey. Like I, port and rum finishes for me, I just they just don't integrate very well often. Um, there's a comment here from Chris Cornell, uh, who is one of the distillers at Archie Rose these days, but also came from, uh, his trips over in the, in the UK and study and also previously whiskey and ailment who says there was a double cask release back in the day, a first fill refill port NWP. 
And that actually rings a bell. And I think that's the one, I, that's possibly the one Robert was referencing. Wait, we're going to have to dive into the archives, Matt. Yeah, okay, we will have to. I, well, I, I have no idea where that is if, 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 if I have one. <laughs> I don't even know if I do. Um, so that's another, that's another time. Um, Lachlan says, do you think the Glen Rangy core range casks that aren't the typical are consistent enough to be considered core? What was that question? So do you think the Glen Rangy core range casks that aren't the typical, as in like uh, Nectar Ore and Quinta Rubin and stuff, uh, are consistent enough to be considered core? Because you were saying before that your Quinta Rubin, your old bottling of it was quite a lot different to how it is today. Oh, yeah. There's, there's been there's been a lot of change uh, in the Quinta Rubin. Lysandra, the similar, they went from, uh, was it 100% um, Oloroso to a mix of Oloroso and, and um, Oh, whatever. Yeah, whatever. So they blend up, uh, they, they, they mixed up, uh, they started mixing the cast in because they weren't able to afford consistency uh, from where they were getting it from. Um, well, just because it's not consistent, um, I don't think you can take away from them that it's their core releases. They consistently release them. It's not so diverse as a lot of other distilleries that you see. Um, it's still reliable, you know, you're not going to open it and then end up tipping it out or giving it away because, because it's going to taste like pus. Uh, it's, there's, there's consistency in what they're doing, but I, I can't say I've got in, in drinking whiskey over the last 20 years, I can't say that um, I, I could, the, the Glenfiddich that I'm having now is the same as the Glenfiddich 20 years ago. It yeah. was the Oban I'm having now is not the same as the Oban I was having 20 years ago. But you could say the same about any. You could say the same about any core range. Totally. It's changed totally. so much over the years. And yeah, um, yeah. Um, Robert Aker says, yeah, that was the one he was talking about, the port refill, first full port one. Fantastic. Um, I've just, uh, I've had a dram tonight. I'm going to go back on topic rather than talking about Glen Rangie all night. Um, of 35.254 Pure Decadence, which is one of the festival releases. Uh, if I'm being completely honest, it's like. Uh, Waxed walnuts on the nose, and it's like a um, a whole packet of fruit tingles in your mouth at once on the palate. Uh, it's a big whiskey, sixty three point nine percent. Really looking forward to sharing that out with members. That's in May Outturn next Friday, and it's also in the pack, which is on the back page of Outturn. If you want to get the five dram tasting pack, which just comes with a live tasting, uh, a little bit like what you're watching now, but with uh, less uh, less um, uh, <laughs> less beards. <laughs> less beards. <laughs> Although by the twenty ninth of May, I might have one by then. So who knows what's going to happen in the next uh, next few weeks? Um, everything is on topic for Friday drinks. That's correct. <laughs> uh, <laughs> says Rob Akers. Just go to Oak Barrel and anything goes. Yeah, anything go, anything goes at the Oak Barrel. That's fine. Um, just talk to Scotty. Uh, tell him I sent you. That's fine. It's it's. I'm gonna make sure you give him hell. Um, any last, last comments coming in here? Uh, talk later. I've got to go and charge my wash still for the uh, for the AM run. Take care, all. Thanks, Jeff. Good to see you running the stills. And um, I'll say good uh, goodbye and good night to you all as well tonight. Thank you guys for joining in on the live with us for the last hour and a half of just good chat and good banter. Thanks um, for having us. It's been good course. fun. And, um, yeah, and uh, we'll catch up with you all soon. Thank you for everyone for the Friday drinks, and we'll um, call it there for a night. Oh wait, 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 wait. There was something I uh, I spied is the. I think in this outturn, I don't know whether it was the rest of them, but this one was really clear. All the bottles now are carrying the new labeling again. Not all, not all, no. but a, a large number of them are, yes. Okay. So yeah. this is the first of the transition outturn with the new labeling okay. and yeah. the, the so new livery. Old labeling, and you got the new one in front. Yes, yeah, so that's a new one. That's a new, well, that's a new festival one. Ah, but the, I don't actually have a normal new one in front of me in the office yet. Logo. But I do have them in outturn. Yeah. Yeah, and that's exciting because you can see the new monogram, which we've been talking about, and uh, the new... Uh, actually, I really like... I can't explain this on camera, but I really like the uh, the new paper stock on the labels. They're just they're all, like, thick and bumpy again, which is what they were a couple of years ago. So they're the really nice paper stock. You remember those ones, don't you? Yeah, you remember that, that thick that thick label? Yeah, that yeah, yeah, yeah. They've got and them you, again, which is great. Yeah, yeah. And um, uh, really appreciate everyone tuning in. Uh, big, uh, jo Jose says... Uh, Jose... Joey says, thanks, Matt B, Matt W, and Steve, and Jose. Fantastic. So a big thanks to you guys from everyone who's been tuning in live tonight. 
Um, and uh, I'll see you all soon. Have a great weekend, everyone. Uh, and uh, I'll be back live on Monday night. The full schedule of what's going to be on the streams next week is mostly festival bottling related. But of course, you'll see it all uh, published on the society pages and group uh, tomorrow, I guess. I'll get, a, I'll get around to that. And um, thank you, everyone. Cheers. Thanks, Steve. Thanks, Matt. See you soon.